parents. This is probably the biggest mistake parents make when they're speaking to an upset child. We try to calm the child down by being more calm ourselves. Mm. So the ice cream falls on the ground and your child's all upset about that. And we say, honey, calm down. It's okay. It's okay. We'll get you more ice cream. Calm, settle down. Calm down. Look at what my hands are doing. Mm. What is the message here? The message is shove it back in. Yeah. Don't express your feelings. Mommy likes you when you're happy, happy. all the time. Yeah. Mommy doesn't like you if you're sad. Dr. Harvey Karp is one of the most trusted pediatricians and child development experts. His landmark discoveries and unique ability to translate complex science into effective techniques to empower parents have revolutionized our understanding of the needs of young children. As the founder and CEO of Happiest Baby, Dr. Karp has devoted his life to helping families raise healthy and happy children. His highly innovative and celebrated books and videos, The Happiest Baby on the Block, The Happiest Toddler on the Block, and the happiest baby guide to great sleep have been translated into dozens of languages and have made him one of the world's most renowned baby and sleep experts. What I love the most about his work is his ability to help us look past techniques and really tune in to our kids. Dr. Karp not only saved my sanity through the toddler years but helped me to see that everyone, no matter what their age, has a burning desire to feel heard and seen. His work has the capacity to change the way we interact with and communicate with our kids when they are distressed, no matter what their age. Dr. Cobb, thank you so much for joining us on Empowered Kids TV today. Your work actually helped um, make the age group of toddlerhood uh, less traumatic for my family. And so I'm really excited and honored to share your work with our readers today. Thank you, Nicole. Really nice to meet you. Uh, now, sometimes the toddlerhood years are described as the terrible twos. But can we talk a bit about when those emo emotional outbursts really begin? Yeah, you know, it's a great question because usually by two years of age, you're almost past this horrible mm. period, not horrible, but this um, tumultuous period. It usually starts around eight or nine months when they start having their own opinions. And mm. it peaks at 18 months. Then it gets better, and then oftentimes there's another peak that happens between three and three and a half years of age where they have many more words, but they still are quite emotional and, and, and easily, you know, kind of explode into, into their emotions. Now, at Empowered Kids, what we try to do, um, we're really dedicated to understanding the emotions that drive our kids' behavior. So Fantastic. with that in mind, can you help us understand what's really happening um, to our kids that cause tantrums in the first place? Sure. Well, you know, um, first there are different types of kids. Some kids are so passionate, you know. Some kids are mild and quiet, you know, they don't want to make waves. So so depending on the type of child you have, I mean, all kids will have temper tantrums at one time or another. But some will have them five times a day and some will have them once every three days. So there's some variation there. Um, and what happens is that during this period of toddlerhood, there's a shift. Um, they're shifting between being infants and mm. being children, between dependent for everything. They can't reach, they can't grab, they can't speak mm. to where they want to be kids. Um, they're going to be able to be very verbal. They're going to be able to be participants in the family. But that transition zone can be difficult. Oftentimes they want things they can't express. Mm. And and just as we would get very upset if we were in a foreign country where no one understood us, but we have strong emotions and feelings, um, that happens with toddlers as well. And then if on top of it they're overly tired or mm. they're overly hungry or they've been cooped up in the house all day, those become additive pressures until <laughs> there's a little explosion. Right. Um, go ahead. Can we talk about what happens mentally when they're experiencing a tantrum? Yeah, you know, this is so interesting because people, we love to know about what happens inside the brain. Yeah. And, and, and there are two halves of the brain. There's the right half and the left half. So if you open up a, someone's skull, you'd see, it almost looks like a walnut, you know, with the two mm -hmm. halves of the nut. Um, the left half is where we're doing most of our work right now. So it's about language and logic mm -hmm. and um, being patient as you're listening to me. Um, and then the right half is about emotionality. It's about um, uh, happiness, you know, dancing and music. And it's also about um, uh, 
the way we speak. Because if I were speaking to just your left brain, I would be speaking like this mm -hmm. with no emotion in my voice. Mm -hmm. But I am using my hands and my voice because I want to let you know this is what's important. Um, no, no, this is what's important. And by mm -hmm. using the way I speak and the way I gesture, that gives you much more information than just plain words. And But this is such an interesting thing because when it comes to young children, they're not that great with their left brains. Mm -hmm. They're not great with saying a lot of words. They're not great with logic or with patience. But they're very, very good with the right half of their brain. So they understand your feelings. They understand your, if you're crying, they'll cry. If you're mm -hmm. scared, your nine month old will totally understand that. So there's some things they're super good at, their brains are super good at, and some things that they're not very good at at all. And, but this is where it gets interesting and really how this work kind of um, also reflects itself in, in older kids and, and uh, adults, which is, excuse me, that the more any of us gets upset, we actually dial down our left half of the brain mm -hmm. and we become less logical, less reasonable, less eloquent. And in fact, um, we have a term for that. We say someone goes ape. Oh my mm -hmm. God, she was so upset she went ape, mm -hmm. meaning that she just got primitive. Mm -hmm. Well, toddlers are primitive on a good day. I mean, that's what I kind of think of them as being cavemen, you know, because, you know, they'll pee anywhere they want yeah. and they'll throw a toy at your head if they're angry. You know, they're primitives. They don't know the rules of society yet. And it's your job as a parent to teach your child the rules of society, mm -hmm. the rules of civilization. But it takes years, you know. Maybe they have a good day today and they understand eating nicely at the table and then the next day they're throwing their food. It takes years for all of those laws of civilization to get learned by a child mm -hmm. so that they learn to say please and thank you and wait in line. And that's the maturation mm -hmm. of the left brain happening. But what's curious is that all of us go ape when we get upset. All mm -hmm. of us turn off our left brains. But since a toddler doesn't have a very mature left brain to begin with, when they get upset, they go Jurassic on you and they can really be out, you know, screaming, squabbering mm -hmm. faces throwing things at you Very they pretty. can just lose it yeah yeah and that's normal that doesn't mean you have a bad child or you're a bad parent um obviously you do have to set limits i'm not saying they can be destructive when they yeah. do that of course not um but you can't stop them from having their strong feelings and for me that's probably the biggest mistake that parents make is that mm. they think that the expression of the emotion has to be stopped right. well if you're feeling if you're very sad and i tell you nicole don't be sad Mm. Well, that doesn't make you not sad. Yeah. But don't be angry. You know what I mean? We need to, with our toddlers, allow them to feel their feelings, allow them to share their feelings with us, but also let them know this is this is how you can express your feelings. And now you're kind of, you're crossing the line, sweetheart. I'm going to have to stop you if you right. keep acting in a way or or doing this behavior because it's not okay. You can be mad, but you can't hit your brother. That right. is not okay. Why don't you stamp your feet or let's hit this pillow because you're so mad? Mm -hmm. But no hitting your brother. That's where we our parenting skills come into play. So given that we've got sort of this this brain dynamic happening um, yeah. and you've identified that it's for all of us, irrespective of our age, the burning question for parents really is, is it actually possible to avoid toddler tantrums or do we just need to accept it as part of toddlerhood? Oh, no. I mean, we have to accept some tantrums. You're always going to have some tantrums. But, of course, you can be more effective and you can help your child reduce the number of tantrums and reduce the severity of the tantrums they have or the duration of the tantrums. Absolutely, because a tantrum is really a child trying to communicate something to you. Right. They're trying to let you know how they feel. And it's just gotten to a point where they've redlined. They've just kind of, you know, lost, lost it. Um, but if you learn how to communicate well to a child, especially in those early periods of frustration, you can often head off a temper tantrum. And actually, even when they have a temper tantrum, if you use a very special type of a technique of talking to them, I call it toddlerese, which is kind of like the language of these primitive little yeah. beings, um, I would say you can stop 50 or 60 percent of temper tantrums in seconds. Mm. And you can and you can help to shorten the rest of them. And it's not a very very complicated technique. It's really basically a way of speaking more to the right brain, which is working because the left brain is is shut off at that time. Can and, we... and you know what's what's if I could just say it's I'll describe toddlerism in a minute with you. But yeah. what's curious to me is that um, 
the way we speak with adults also has to become more primitive when we're speaking to an adult who's upset. So, for example, if you were very mad at me and I said to you, that's very upsetting, Nicole. I understand why you feel that way. I, I mean, you want to smack me at that point. Yeah. I mean, it's not that my words are wrong, right? Not you want to smack me, but one might want to. Yep. But, um, but, you know, the words are right, but there's no feeling of understanding or empathy. Yes. On the other hand, if I said something that was more mm, really directed at your right brain, not so many words, not so much logic, but more emotion. And if I said, look, oh, Nicole, Nicole, I am sorry, 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 sorry. I, am so, I, I mean, I'll tell you what happened. It was a terrible situation, but I see how mad you are. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry that you're that way. I'm sorry that I disappointed you. That's very rep- repetitive, and it seems a little bit odd. Mm-hmm. But if you were really mad, it actually would feel pretty good. So can you take us through that journey in terms of how should we move from the typical way of communicating to communicating in a way that's more effective, that one sure. would help us reduce tantrums with toddlers, but also that we can use and translate to our older kids as well. You bet. So there are two techniques. In my, in my Happiest Baby work, there are five um, steps that you do called the five S's that turn on the baby's calming reflex so you can calm even colicky crying usually in, in minutes or seconds and help babies sleep longer. The baby stuff is based on the idea that babies are born three months before they're really ready for the world. And I've never talked to them into trying that. It's just a theory. But our babies really are fetuses that we deliver. Of course, we have to deliver them, but they're not ready for the world. And by three and four and five months, they're smiling and cooing and they're really human beings. But the first three or four months, they're kind of smushy and they're really yeah. not quite ready yet. The key concept with toddlers is that they are primitives. They're cave they're cave boys and girls. And so, especially when they're upset. And so you need to speak in a more primitive language. So there are two steps um, that are key in this happiest toddler approach. One, I call the fast food rule, which mm-hmm. is kind of a crazy rule, but it means that um, whoever is hungriest for attention gets to go first. Which is usually the toddler. It usually is the toddler, yes. but not always. Sometimes, you know, if your child runs into the street, yeah. you're more upset, you yes. know, then you get to go first. But um, it turns out, if I could just talk about normal communication for a second. Yeah. If we're having a conversation, there's a rule that mm, this, that dictates how we're going to have a conversation. You may not realize that, but the rule is called turn-taking. Mm. You say something, then I say something, then you say something, and we go back and forth, kind of like a tennis match, yeah. back and forth. <clears throat> now... Um, if you just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and never give me an opportunity, I'm going to get frustrated mm. and I'm not going to feel like you're very interested in me or that we have a very good friendship. Mm. Unless, unless you're very upset about something. Because if you're upset, the rule suddenly changes. It's no longer expected that we're going to take turns. Yeah, eventually I'll get a turn. But if you're very upset, I'm going to let you go for a long time mm. because you need to express yourself. And I need to acknowledge your feelings so that you know you're heard and you're cared about Mm -hmm. so if you're upset i'm not going to say to you uh that's very upsetting right like i did before that that's the words are right but it doesn't feel like i really get it yeah what i'm going to do is i'm going to use a simple language to acknowledge your feelings using short words and phrases so i might say something like what no what tell me what happened Mm -hmm. what did you do then Oh my God, and what then? So I'm having a little bit of your emotion. I'm not hysterical. I'm not going, oh no, no, oh no, Nicole, that's terrible. You know, I'm not getting mm-hmm. up there. I'm not as emotional as you are, but I have to have a little emotion for you to feel like I get it. Yeah. And so that's called the fast food rule. That concept is then coupled with this idea of toddlerese or speaking to the right brain, which has three steps to it. Short phrases, lots of repetition yeah. and mirroring about a third of your feelings right so it's this is probably the biggest mistake parents make when they're speaking to an upset child we try to calm the child down by being more calm ourselves mm. so the ice cream falls on the ground and your child's all upset about that and we say honey calm down it's okay it's okay we'll get you more ice cream calm, settle down calm down look at what my hands are doing mm. 
what is the message here? The message is shove it back in. Yeah. Don't express your feelings. Mommy likes you when you're happy, happy. all the time. Yeah. Mommy doesn't like you if you're sad. And what happens is the child has two ways of responding to that. They either grow up saying, sc- learning to scream louder, like, do you not understand how upset mm. I am, Mom? Don't tell me to settle down. I'm mad. Or they learn to keep everything inside because my mother, even my mother who loved me so much, never really wanted to hear how I felt. She always wanted to shove those feelings back in. Neither one of those are very good situations, yeah. right? So the way you can <clears throat> encourage your child's feelings to express their feelings to you so that they learn that as they grow up, they can share anything with you, mm. anything, because you treat them with respect. Not that you agree with them, but you're willing to listen because you understand if they have feelings, they have feelings, yes. you know, and that's something that if you love somebody, you want to hear how they feel. And so it's short phrases, repetition, mirroring a third of their feelings. So, for example, if your child wants a cookie, your two-year-old's crying, a cookie, cookie, mommy, you know, over and over again, but you don't want to give a cookie because it's dinner time. You might say something like, "You first you point to the cookie and you go, cookie, 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 you want you want you say my 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 cookie i'm talking about an upset 18 month old mm. or two year old obviously if they're older you're going to use mature language like sweetheart i know you want that you love eating cookies you want cookies all the time you might say that to your four or five year old mm. i wish i could give you the cookies honey i wish i could give you a hundred cookies but you know the rule we're mm. going to eat dinner now so what should we do should we have like mm, Let's have the cookies after dinner, but you want one cookie or two cookies after dinner, Mm. you know, and you can kind of get him along into a different mm, feeling like, okay, I'm acknowledged for my feelings, which is a kind of a consolation prize. I can't get the thing I really want, but I knew I wasn't going to get it anyway, you know, because I know it's (laughs) against the rules. I'm just going to try. But um, what happens, this isn't magic. It's not like all of a sudden they're going to say, okay, mom, thank you very much. And they're not going to be upset. Yeah. But the more you do this, the more they learn that, okay, my, you know, my mom cares about me. She respects me. Sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes they're going to still have a full-on meltdown. And we can talk about what to do in that situation yep. in a minute. Um, but, um, but that's the first step, not just acknowledging your child's feelings as if they're your co-worker or your buddy at work, mm. but literally as if you're talking to a more primitive individual and you need to do this repetition and more gesturing. Using your hands, that's an important part. No, no, you don't want it. No, no, you say, no, I don't want to go to the bath, mommy. You say, no bath, no bath. But, sweetheart, you know we have to have a bath, so should we play one minute or three minutes before we have mm. the bath? You know, then you get into your options. Okay. Uh, what do we do then when, because we'll have those occasions, as you, as you just said, when we would take the time to really express that we've understood them, but we still need to say no. Sure. Can we say no in a way that doesn't then trigger the tantrum after we've, we've taken the time to express that I, I hear you and I do understand you? Sure, sure. You can try at least, right? Yes. It's not always going to work. I <laughs> yes. mean, again, it depends on the time of day and if they've been cooped up. I mean, right. there, are, there are things out of your control. But um, for the most part, they are just like we are. They want someone to genuinely, sympathetically acknowledge us, not just do it in a kind of a technique way, but really care mm-hmm. heart to heart. And, and to do that, you need to repeat it four, five, six, seven, eight times. Mm. And you need to do it with sincerity in your voice. So you can't just say, honey, I know you want a cookie, but you know the... No, that went by way too fast. Right. You have to say it five or six or seven times. Even with adults, we say that. Remember what I did before? I said, yes. Nicole, I am sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry, mm. really. I put you in a bad situation. I'm really, really, really sorry. It's repetitive. But it feels right. You and haven't so done we, anything to me, and I feel better when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, because we so want that, don't we? We kind yeah. of are so hungry for that kind of acknowledgement. And what, what a gift it is to give to your child to do that, yeah. because, you know, um, with my, I, I'm, my baby work is used. We have three thousand happiest baby educators across the United States and twenty five other lang- uh, nations, including. Uh, um, the UK, Ireland, and, and and that's important work because it helps to prevent child abuse, it helps to mm-hmm. prevent postpartum depression, and it helps poor parents get through those very difficult first three, four, five months of life. 
Having said that, the toddler work is so much more important mm. because between eight months of age and five years of age, you've created a person. Yes. And that's pretty much how they're going to be. It's not that they can't go through therapy and things like that yeah. later. But you've taught them how people who love each other communicate with each mm. other. If it's always through threats, they're going to grow mm. up to be a bully and learn how to use threats. If it's always through giving in and spoiling them, then they're going to grow up spoiled. Mm. So you don't want either of those extremes. Yeah. You want them to understand emotions. People who love each other pay attention to each other's emotions. Mm. doesn't mean we give in to it, but we do pay attention to it. And then we try to work out a compromise yes. as best we can. Yes. And that's really ultimately the hard job of parenting because you're constantly coming into conflict with this very strong-minded child mm -hmm. who has different opinions yes you know and and so you have to respect the opinions um and sometimes you don't have patience for that nobody's perfect parent every yes. day you know so you know we all judge ourselves on that and and so you know hopefully you'll have three good days out of five you know <laughs> I, we have to be realistic about that but um but it's when you practice this that it becomes more normal for you. And when you do it over and over again with your child, they learn to expect that. So when they pick their friends, they're going to pick friends who respect them. Yes. Your child will come back and say, Mommy, I don't like Bobby. He, he's just a bully. He won't listen to me. I told him I didn't mm. like it when he scared me, and he kept making fun of me. Mm. Well, that's a good job, son. You know, there's some people who respect you and some people who don't. And you can tell them, I don't like it when you do that, but maybe he's not your good friend anymore. Mm. You know, so um, it allows children to learn the taste of the type of relationship they're looking mm. for later in life when they pick their friends, when they pick their loved ones. They're going to pick people who respect them rather than people who disrespect them. That's amazing. That's powerful because... I think we've always just focused on tantrums as a problem with our kids and never really brought ourselves into the situation to see where we where we not holding up our end of the bargain where we actually not validating our kids feelings and pushing them mm -hmm. aside and what yeah. are the actual effects of that so that was really powerful yeah. for me yeah. what do we and do it is, and it is exactly the title of your show it's about empowering yes. them and the hard thing as a parent is that, you know, we have to take, we have to take classes to get a driver's license. Yes. But the most challenging job we have, we're just told, go yes. do it. And we think we're supposed to know how to do it. And if you have a lot of experience with young kids, maybe you do know how to do it. But most of us have very little experience mm -hmm. with kids. And we try to do it, like, out of love and reasoning, you know, as you would with uh, another adult or through authoritative yeah. measures, which, you know, both of those can lead you in a bad direction. What do we do um, at the times when we have tried our best, but the tantrum is still full on? How do we how do we manage it in a way that one keeps them safe, still allows them to feel loved and validated, but gives them the, the room to to get all that emotion out? Sure. So um, sometimes, so in the in the so there's a happiest toddler DVD and there's a happiest toddler book. I usually recommend people watch the DVD first. Because, number one, it's hard for anyone to get through a 300-page parenting book and, <laughs> and to remember it. But number two, my work is very technique-driven. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps to watch it. So it's a half-hour DVD that you can watch and learn the essence of the techniques very quickly. Um, so, if, uh, so in the book, however, the book then, after the DVD, after you master the DVD, the book has a lot more information. So it's a good one-two kind of tool. And in the book, I talk about green light, yellow light, and red light behaviors. Yeah. Green light behaviors are things you want to encourage, like patience and sharing. Yeah. Um, yellow light are things that you don't like, but they're not terrible, like dawdling or pinching you yeah. or you know, name calling, things like that. And red light behaviors are things that are dangerous or aggressive and that have to be stopped immediately. Right. So as a parent, you have to kind of learn what to to categorize the behavior if your child is having a temper tantrum and they're ripping things off the wall well that's a red light yeah. behavior that's not allowed um if however they're just you know pissing and moaning on the ground yeah. and kicking and screaming um what i do is a, a pa parents today are taught to use a technique called ignoring in other words turn your back so that you're not accidentally encouraging the behavior mm -hmm. and then once they stop then you pay attention to them. And this is a very commonly used technique. 
but there's a problem with the technique, um, which is that it's very disrespectful. If you are upset with me and I say, um, you know what, um, Nicole, um, I know you're mad, but, you know, talk to the hand and I'll be back when you calm down. You know, I don't know. It doesn't feel so good. It's a power. It's a, you know, uh, a power game. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to just stand there and watch them for 15 mm-hmm. minutes because then you're the audience and they're performing to you. Yes. So you have to acknowledge their feelings and then turn away. I call it kind ignoring. Mm-hmm. So you lovingly acknowledge, you're mad and you're on the ground and you're kicking and screaming and you're, you're not even looking at me right now. You don't even like mommy right now. You're mad, mad. So you go ahead and I love you so much, sweetheart. You go ahead and cry and I'll be back in a minute. Mm-hmm. And then you turn away. You don't leave, but you pretend that you're doing something else. Mm. So you ignore your child. And a lot of times, the first time you do that, they look at you and then they follow you to the next mm. room like, Rrr! and like, you know, they don't want to miss a second of it because they know it's going to work. Uh, but um, after you do this five or six or seven times, what happens is they're not getting the reward of your attention. Mm. And so the tantrum tends to get shorter and shorter. Um, but they're still so getting the validated. Yeah, just, you still validate yes. them. And in fact, after 20, 30 seconds, if they're still tantruming, I would come back and I'd do the same technique over again. You're still yes. mad, mad, you're still not happy, and you're mad, and you're looking down, and you're kicking, and you're mad. So you go ahead, and then I'd go away, and then I'd come back again. And I might have to do that three or four times, mm. especially for these tough little boys, you know, <laughs> who are stubborn, and they paint themselves into the corner. Um, and that's an important issue in terms of toddlers, since they're primitive, they have a very strong sense of saving face. Mm. They don't like to be embarrassed, they don't like to be shamed, they don't like to be made fun of. Mm. And so, in a way, a parent is like an ambassador to these Mm. primitive people, where you have to be respectful. Not that you give up your authority, because you're gonna make the final decision. That's Mm. your job as a parent, you have to make the final decisions. You set limits, and if those limits are violated, you have to act on that, Mm. so that's your job. But you can do it respectfully. You can do it like mm-hmm. an ambassador would do it in a respectful way. And again, what you're teaching your child is that big people who could be threatening actually would rather choose to be respectful mm-hmm. and to gain your consideration that way. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, that leads to a much better relationship when your kids are five, six, seven, and eight, rather than because that threatening stuff kind of loses its effectiveness after a while. One of the things that I wanted to discuss is. From the concept of, of tantrums, the spotlight usually just gets beamed onto toddlers. But I wanted to expand it and talk about um, older kids um, and even adults for a bit, just to say, do we experience uh, the similar sort of mental behavior um, when we do have an emotional outburst, when we do get upset? Absolutely. It's really the same exact thing. And so the toddlerese behavior and the, and the fast food rule idea Those are universal communication techniques. You'll use those with your older kids, with your adults, friends, with your husband, with your mother-in-law. However, remember I said toddleries are short phrases, repetition, and mirroring a third of the feeling, getting in the sweet spot. Now, as you're dealing with older kids, you use more words, and your emotional level goes down a little bit. Mm. So the sweet spot goes down. So you wouldn't say to your nine-year-old, you're mad, 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 you don't mm. like that, because then he's going to, you wouldn't even say to your three-year-old, to yeah. be honest with you, they're going to go, don't talk like that, why are you talking weird, you know, <laughs> because it feels patronizing, yes. unless they're in a total meltdown. Right. I mean, because even with an adult, if you were in a total meltdown, I would use that same repetitious kind of speech. Right. Um, with your teenager, You know, I might say, you know, they want the car keys, but they didn't do the cleaning up the backyard like they were supposed to. And they're all upset when you won't give them the car keys. You might say, look, honey, I get it. I know you're upset, and I'm sorry you're upset, because I want to give you the car keys. I mean, you were looking forward to going, and I want to give you the car keys, but I can't give it to you because you didn't do the job you said you were going to do. So Mm -hmm. as much as I want to do it, as much as I would love to give you the car keys, I can't because then I'm going against my own word. You could see I had some emotion. I repeated the same thing 10 times. Yes. But again, it feels kind of right yes. when you're in this type of a conflict. Yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Kapp. Um, oh, my pleasure. Your insights and your wisdom, I know will help all of us to be able to communicate more Thanks. effectively with our, with our kids, irrespective of their age, when we all have those emotional outbursts. So thank you again for sharing your wisdom with us. 
Thank you, Nicole. I so appreciate you reaching out. Thank you for joining us for this episode. We're all about sharing and support in this village. So if you found value in this episode, be sure to share it with your family and friends. And remember, this is a weekly show. So if you haven't already, subscribe and hit that bell icon so that you'll be notified of our next episode. As we always say in the village, you're just one connection away. With love and gratitude empower us. Until next time.